this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Rob Walling. Rob has started many companies. He talks about all about the roadblocks, the challenges he hit. He started Get Drip, Hit Tail, the conference MicroConf. He has a book, Start Small, Stay Small, and many more. And he really gets personal on some of the things and just putting ourselves out there in life and business. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Rob Walling, and before I t give him the intro, he does so much. I listed everything out, but if I did, if I listed everything, it'd be a while. So I'm only going to name a few, which is still a lot. So Rob operates a number of software products, including Hittail, GetDrip, .NET Invoice. His blog, Software by Rob, is followed by over 25,000 web entrepreneurs. He also has a startup podcast and founded MicroConf which is a conference for self-funded startups. And it really, if you look at the page, it attracts some of the best speakers and the attendees around. And he's author of Start Small, Stay Small. Rob, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I always like to include a fun fact. Um, and I know you're gonna to talk to us about some of the valuable lessons you learned in your journey and mistakes you made. But fun fact about Rob is he was actually lead singer and guitarist in a punk band in LA called Courtesy Flush. There Would have never go. known that. Yeah, I haven't talked about it online, so that's <laughs> cats right. out the bag. So I'm excited to talk to you and hear your big lessons you learned from mistakes you made on your journey, so we can learn from them too. Um, from early on, what was one that sticks out to you? Well, you know, early on, even before I, I really started building and launching apps, I was kind of, of dreaming of, of being an entrepreneur and, and starting companies. And I would, uh, I was reading the press. I mean, this is the, the 90s, so there really wasn't much online about it. But I remember carrying magazines around with me, Inc. Magazine in particular. And um, there was, uh, I learned the lesson that you, that I didn't want to put myself out there too much because people were they like to be naysayers and there's a specific time where i had a, an ink magazine at work and i was reading it and this guy just kind of went off and um it made me i don't know i was pretty like you know concerned by it i just felt kind of ashamed or like well, am i in the wrong is this guy in the wrong and it, it it made me pull back and and stop sharing and kind of hiding these these entrepreneurial dreams from other people so what were you doing at the time at that at that job? I had a salary. It was a salary job. I was a project manager at a at an electrical contractor. Do you remember what what did he say? He um, basically said, "Ink Magazine." Oh, geez, yeah, that's really great. Hey, look at this. And then he like pulled someone else in into the room, and he's like, "Look really? what he's doing. What is he? What does he think he's going to be?" See, yeah, it was this strangest thing. It was in an office too. It was like a professional setting. It was it was always bizarre to me that uh, that someone would go out of their way to kind of be be like that you know at that time what were you thinking like what did you want to obviously you always aspired to do something what was it at that time right. um at that time i wanted to run some type of company i thought i wanted to be the ceo of a large company um, that was actually a large electrical contractor i worked for and i was thinking man one day i may want to run this place you know it was at their peak they did 500 million in in, in uh, billable work uh -huh. and so that was one thing on my radar but in the back of my mind i always thought i wanted to do something smaller you know do a smaller idea but that wasn't even feasible at that point this is like 1996 97 and so what do you think was different? Obviously, like you were in the same company. What do you think caused you to think the way you think? And obviously that person thinks the exact opposite. I think that I think certain people, um, they, they let fear. There's this fear that's around us. There are certain people you'll watch the way they parent, as an example, and it's fear-based parenting. They're so scared. Oh, my, my kid can't get near the oven because they're going to get burned. I don't want my child getting muddy because there could be something in the mud that makes him sick. I don't want him to get dirty, blah, blah, blah. There's just, it's fear-based parenting. And, yeah. and you have to be within reason, but you can't, uh, in my opinion, the way I live my life is you, you have to not let fear run it. And so I think it's the same thing. In any given office setting, there are going to be a few people who are trying to break through that and who have dreams you know and who want to do something bigger than themselves mm -hmm. and then 
and they may have fear, but they're willing to to fight through that anxiety and beat the fear in order to because these dreams are more important to them, and they know that if they don't go after them, that they'll never they'll basically never be happy. Whereas if you don't have those dreams, then you you can let fear kind of uh, you know hold you down, and then I think naturally you kind of want to hold others down if you're being held down. So so what did your family or upbringing do so that you didn't have as much of that fear that you wanted to kind of do something more? I, so I did have a lot of fear, um, to be honest, and it took me a long time to get through it. I, my dad was not an entrepreneur. He actually was a project manager for that same electrical contractor. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not him who uh, made fun of me, by the way. I was. In case you're kind of <laughs> no, but you know what my dad told me, though, is he said, um, he basically told me that, uh, you know, he never did anything entrepreneurial. He always wanted to, but I think he was kind of, concerned about, I think he was held down by, by his fear of failure. He also had a family and so he couldn't, you know, couldn't do it. He had a family of, of four kids. Um, so my upbringing wasn't particularly conducive to it, aside from the fact that when I was young, I started doing entrepreneurial stuff at school, selling candy, et cetera. And my dad really encouraged that. And he just said, you, someday you will do something with that. Like you are, he kept telling me like, you're not like other kids. You're doing something unique. And so that planted the seed that I that that this could someday you know be a reality for me yeah and you have kids so what what do you do with them now that you know that you know to to kind of get them over that i try to encourage them to to not be afraid and to get through the the blocks uh kind of the mental blocks to do things like my, my seven-year-old said you know someday i want to make a movie or someday when I'm older, I'm going to make a movie. And I said, why don't you make one now? And so we did. We bought, he got a, a put a stop motion camera on his wish list and mm -hmm. got it for Christmas. And we made a short film. That's you know? awesome. But that's the kind of, anytime he says, someday I'm going to this, or when I'm bigger, when I'm older, I, I always say, why don't you do that now? That's he wants great. to start a podcast as well. And he's like, oh, when I'm older, I can do that. And I said, no, we're going to start one now. I'll, I'll listen to it. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> He's already has his feature in uh, your talk at, in Vancouver. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, so, what about when you first started one of the the early companies? What kind of things did you you know wrote, you know run up against? Yeah, I launched a number of of small ideas. Well, they were ideas that should have been big, but uh, or I wanted them to be big, but they you know they never took off. Um, it was it was hard in in two thousand ninety nine to two thousand. Four. I had a ton of failures, and the hard part was that there wasn't many people. There weren't many people talking about how to do this. There weren't the single founders. Um, there, there was no thought about building an MVP and doing things small. Or even, I didn't even know really that you could be a single founder and build a small software company. And so, every idea I went after was what I was reading about in Inc. Magazine and Fast Company and uh, Business 2.0, which I love that magazine. But it really kind of deluded me into thinking that you know 99% of, of success was coming up with this crazy idea because that's kind of how the magazines presented it and then it was like question mark question mark question mark and then success and so no one filled in that question mark question mark question mark part which was execution and having skills to do these things and typically having 10 million dollars of funding in the bank and and on and on so I, I launched ideas. I launched a, a, an idea called Flogs, which was a dig for personal finance. So it's like social news that where people voted things up and down. And um, it was just a dumb idea to do as a solo founder with no funding. Why? What did you find? What did you run up against? Well, I mean, to do to do an idea that requires you know a million page views a month or more in order to make any type of real money because you need to make money on advertising is just I I don't know of any kind of solo software developer who's ever made money with that. In addition, it wasn't really in much of a niche, and it wasn't a niche that I had any access to or any real knowledge of, uh, aside from kind of being a consumer of of you know personal finance news. Um, so I just kind of made all the, the classic mistakes that I would list off today, uh, not solving a pain point, not having a niche, not charging someone money, not being able to charge someone, you know, a, a high price point. And, um, yeah, that, well, it was a failure. Well, what point do you figure that out? Because you're someone who kind of sticks with things. How did you decide yeah. when to stop? Yeah, that was that was tough, actually. That's, I sometimes do that to a fault, you know, and stick with things too long. Uh, with flogs in particular, 
it was probably six months of nights and weekends um just i think that was post launch so that was just trying to beat the bushes and get people to come to the site and spending money on ads and which is funny right it's like you spend money on ads to drive someone to a site where you try to make money on ads i mean it, it just the whole thing was just crazy but i didn't i didn't know anything and there was no one to ask and um so that was yeah that was kind of the the failure so i think i let it go for about six months and it was painfully apparent to me that it was never going to take off really like what well, I'd tried everything that I had any idea that could drive, drive traffic, including cold emailing bloggers before anyone did that. This is 2004, 2005. Um, and there, I think the highest traffic I ever got was, uh, you know, 500 unique visitors in a month. Got it. And so at one point you're just like, next. There, yep, it's got to be done. And I think actually some event happened, and I don't remember what it was. We either either I started consulting again, or I, I may have gotten a salary job and gone away from consulting, like some work transition happened. And I remember saying, I need to, this thing's not going and I need to focus on this new opportunity, yeah. you know, kind of focus on that. So that. That's what caused me to bail on that. Yeah. So what was the next major roadblock or mistake? I, I did a similar thing. I improved my, I learned from that mistake and I actually did, uh, pick a niche this time and I did solve a pain point and it was uh, it was an app called Feedshot which was um, a blog search engine submission service and it may have been too small of an idea because I couldn't charge enough money for it to make it viable it actually was pretty popular and this one caught on really quick and got blogged about by a bunch of people because at the time there were 30 or 40 blog search engines um, and I mean they've it was kind of a weird there was one called Ice Rocket, and there was Technorati, which is still around. But uh, of the 30, I think Technorati is the only one that's still around. And so I built a search engine submission service. Now, the nice part is that I coded it up in you know a few a couple of weekends. Um, it did solve a pain point, and it was in in a niche. The hard part is that I couldn't. I got a lot of people to use it. Um, I think I got 5,000, 10,000 uniques the first month, which is you know that was insane for me. And this again is before Twitter and before a lot of the stuff that we have today to drive traffic. So it was, it was crazy to get that kind of, of traffic. But when I tried to charge even 99 cents or $2 or, you know, I tried a bunch of different price points. It just didn't really make money. I think it made at its peak, it made $70 in a month or something. So how do you so, know when to stop that one? It was similar. I, um, for cause in this one, you're getting a lot of traffic, getting a lot of traffic. And that was sustained, you know, I think it dropped down to, but it was a sustained between two and five thousand uniques a month, and so it was a re it was like oh, I could kind of do something with this, and I just kept surveying people, asking what else could I build because they obviously weren't going to pay two bucks for this, and I was trying to figure out what features to build, um, and nothing I don't know nothing came about. It was a similar thing where it was like it went on for six months. I invested the time, I did AdWords for it, and just at a two dollar price point, you can't you know you can't do AdWords even back then. It was too expensive. Um, and I, exa I just exhausted every possible uh, road that I could go down and then threw up my hands in frustration because I said, this is not worth my time. And that time I was, I was either consulting or I went back to consulting and I was billing $100 an hour. And I'm like, I'm making 70 bucks a month and spending 30 hours on this. It's ridiculous. Right. You know, I just became so frustrated. You just get fed up at some point and that's, right. that's what I hit with that one. And at the time too, you said there wasn't a lot of resources online of yeah. what people were doing. That's right. So what was yeah. um, what was the next um, roadblock you hit? I um, I mean to be honest, the next I backed off for about a year. I think I kind of was I was burned out by it, and I um, yeah I went back to salaried employment and I just took time off. So I think, I mean, that was kind of a partial roadblock, you know, uh, in startup stuff because I just got so fed up with it and I didn't feel like I was able to move things forward. And so I wound up um, having kind of a success. That was kind of the next big milestone was uh, uh, coming across a piece of software for sale called .NET Invoice. And it was basically an al in alpha and they had pre-sold some copies of it. Um, but it was quite buggy and i wound up acquiring that from those guys and i guess so i guess I, the roadblock that happened there is i i overpaid for it and then i had to spend months fixing bugs that i didn't know about and that would be something that ter kind of terrified me right because i i spent uh, eleven thousand dollars i'm pretty sure and i didn't have a lot of money um 
And so I was pretty concerned that I had you know, lost the money when I, when I spent this uh, and it didn't turn out the way I thought. Um, but then I spent a couple of months fixing bugs and, and pretty soon I realized that there was actually a need for this software and it started selling pretty well. And so that roadblock was the one that I, that I made it past. And it, mm-hmm. it did take a couple months, but finally seeing the first real revenue from an app was, was a really big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal because you're, you're pushing through all of these you know, kind of roadblocks. What's right. another big um, milestone, like a success that you hit that you're proud of that you look back on? Um, I was really pleased. Yeah, .NET Invoice was, was a, definitely a big milestone. The other milestone I was happy about was the day I had a number that I had to hit in order to quit consulting and quit salaried employment. Well, it was, it was consulting because I was doing that for three years at, uh, at that point. And the, I don't remember what the number was. I think it was, I think it was around 8,000 bucks a month that I needed to hit. And the, the first month that I hit that and, and was able to quit consulting and was able to wake up that, that morning and go to, to, you know, borders or whatever it was and just, not have to work for anyone and not have a client. Um, mm-hmm. That was a huge, huge deal for me. That that changed my life, to be honest. Was there any internal struggle with that? Like thinking, because looking back at the other products that didn't work as well, were you like, oh, maybe I should do both for a while? Or were you just gung-ho, all in? Um, there was internal struggle, yes. Uh, I think my my bigger internal struggle was well, my internal struggle is was fear of of quitting consulting because it was so lucrative. You know, I was I was making a lot more than eight thousand bucks consulting a month, uh, two to three times that, frankly. And so that was that was a big struggle of like, am I leaving this safety net and this high right. earning thing that I've been doing for years? I have clients, I'm bailing on this, and I'm going to go. Um, you know, jump on this product bandwagon, so to speak. That I that I'm I'm pretty confident that I can do this, but you know, I didn't know if I could hold it. Could I do this for ten years? I don't know. You know, um, so yeah, I definitely there was definitely internal struggle. So there. how did you get over that? Because most people maybe they're at a job they don't even like, but you're still doing your own thing as a consultant and doing well. Yeah, I got over it because you know. There are certain things in your life that you are made to do that you have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen King, who's a you know a novelist, he was asked. He said, "I'm retiring uh, from publishing," and so, or "I'm retiring." And someone said, "Oh, so you're not going to write anymore?" And he said, "You're nuts. I have to write. That's what I do. I'm retiring from publishing." You know, what I'm saying there's a difference mm-hmm. for him between writing and publishing, and he'll probably have 20 works that come out after he dies. You know, that he has in a, in a closet somewhere because that's what he does, and that's what I felt. Not to be too grandiose with myself, but I've realized like I have to create things and I have to be mm-hmm. free of of constraints. And and doing client work just wasn't where it was at. And working for uh, a salary employment, you know, that I didn't enjoy wasn't where it was at. And I knew that long term, I I had to do this or I would quite literally regret it for my my entire life. Yeah. And, and with the consulting, I mean, you're doing well and you are you know, doing well, obviously, with the products, too. Was there a conversation you had at home um, that, you know, because you obviously you have a wife, you're discussing these things. How does that work? Yeah, there, there were many conversations. And the way that it worked was that she had seen the progression that I had let her know. I didn't let her know about all the failures. I, sometimes I would just say, oh, I'm working on stuff, but I would tell her, oh, I closed something down. Or, hey, I just bought .NET Invoice. I didn't tell her how much I paid for it because it was consulting money that I had. Um, mm-hmm. But once that started being successful, I said, hey, I made a, you know, a couple thousand bucks from this .NET Invoice thing. It's pretty interesting. And then a year later, having another success, hey, I made a few thousand from that site. And it built up confidence uh, from her that I could actually pull this off. Because if I had just come one day and said, hey, I'm going to drop this lucrative consulting gig, she would have freaked out. She mm-hmm. was pretty stressed about it, you know, because I was, uh, she was an intern um, at the time and I was, she, she wasn't making much money. And so I was basically paying the mortgage and we had a son and, you know, there was a lot on the line for right. it. So, yeah, the, the reality is it, it's not just you're, I mean, you're, it's not just you sitting in a vacuum making a decision. That's right. Especially when you have a family like that. So she was, she kind of saw that progression. You kind of let her in and shared some things. So she kind of saw that at that point, was she still okay with, yeah, drop? I mean, because you're doing well as a consultant. 
Yeah. I had talked about it for a long time, though, you know, probably a year before I stopped. I said, hey, I think I might get there in a year. Like it's building to that point. Mm -hmm. And I think I can hit my number with products in a year. And she's like, OK, if you do that, then, you know, you can you can leave. But I mean, talk about prep, you know, it wasn't <laughs> like I said, I'm going to do it next month. I said, I'm going to do it in a year. So there was a right. lot, a long runway for her to get used to it. Right, right. Yeah, that's important. Now, what about and I know, like a lot of the stuff you do now is very successful. What about recently? as far as mistakes or failures? Yeah, I, I got to be honest. And we talked a little bit about this in the pre-interview, but I, I wanted to bring up a mistake from maybe the past couple of years. And I haven't had as many failures as I, I think I should have. Because I think if you're not failing, that you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I, I feel like maybe after thinking about it today, that I'm kind of been staying in my safety zone. And that's pretty lame. Like, I, I think I need to figure out how not to do that and how to push, push past the, the fear. You know, I imagine that there are things um, that I have not done almost unconsciously because I'm thinking that they're too much of a stretch and that if I fail now, it's going to be a public failure. I mean, I guess to be honest, like I'm launching an app uh, next month and that I've been somewhat concerned about that because it is a public display, you know, and it's like, since I'm teaching other people how to launch startups, what if it fails? And that's been, right. that's been on my mind for sure. Yeah. And I guess that's a good point because when you're early on, it's just you and now you have a huge following. And when you put it out there, it's, you're putting it out there and people are going to know about it. And it comes, all comes back to that judgment. Remember earlier I said, like, I, I didn't want to put myself out there yeah. 15 years ago because the guy judged me. And it's like, that's a similar, it's a similar thing. It's, you know, on a, on a larger scale now. Do you think, though, that because of this audience, like people are in the same boat and they kind of just are more supportive? I do. I do think that. And I also think I've gotten a thicker skin and realized that when people say stuff, they may not mean it or they may not know what they're talking about or they may just some people are, you know, just judgmental and just want to hate on other people, maybe because they want to, they wish they were doing something, they wish they weren't at their salary job right. or whatever. Right. And so I think trying to come at it with a, oh, everyone who says these things isn't actually, they don't really wish you ill. Maybe they have other reasons for saying those things yeah. that, that can be internal, internal reasons. Yeah. What about some, maybe not failures, but missed opportunities that you have seen? Yeah, I... There's a, there's a couple things I've been thinking about lately, and um, you know I wrote a book called Start Small, Stay Small, and that was three years ago. I'm pretty sure it was three years ago that I published. I hope it wasn't four. Yeah, I think it was three. And I kind of feel like I I I want to follow up on it, and I had a goal in 2012 to do it, and I've had a goal in 2013 to do it, and either to write a, a second book or to to revise that one and update it because the information's you know, three years old, it's it's just not as valuable as something that would be written today. And I feel like that needs to happen, but I just haven't been able to make the time with everything I'm doing. That's the trade-off, right? It's like you do a lot of things and it's fun and interesting, but I have to miss, I have to miss some opportunities sometime. And then writing the book or writing a second book has been one of those things that I just haven't been able to carve out those three months to do that. I mean, but there's another thing that you were innovative with and what you did with the book. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, what you created um, the, the academy. Yeah, that's right. So the, the Micropreneur Academy, it's at micropreneur.com, is uh, like an online training site for, for people who are trying to bootstrap you know, bootstrap like a software company. Basically, all the struggles that I had in early 2000s, I tried to, I'm trying to help people avoid that stuff. Right. And so... That's right. That is the other thing. Um, Micropreneur, when I launched it, was like there was no education that I knew of in this space. No one was talking about how to start startups. No one was talking. They were talking about it, but there was no like in-depth education. Like formalized. And yeah. Tactical stuff. And so I worked half time. It was about 20 hours a week. And I think it was almost a year to build the academy. And I had customers in, I mean, I got them in after about a couple months of, of working on it, but then I spent the next 10 months filling out all the content, you know, and, and dripping it out to people. And so it was a tremendous amount. It was everything I knew at that point in time on, on how to launch stuff. And, and it was cool and it made a, a small splash. It wasn't as big as, as say the book made. The book was a year after. Um, but being the front runner, I don't know if it's like, I was kind of at the forefront of that movement, and now there's a ton of, of 
different people doing that, right? There's tons of different opportunities to do it. And I wonder, I almost feel like the Academy needs a revamp and like, um, I've, I maybe missed an opportunity there as well. I mean, you know, even, with, yeah, I was going to say even early on though, you had, um, a bunch of people go through it. What was, what was like some of the success stories? What was the success story that you remember? Oh yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The Academy is still alive and well and new yeah. people are joining it and new people still get value out of it. So I'm not saying that it's like dead or anything yeah. like that. Um, but I have seen people do stuff on a bigger, on a larger scale and wonder if the Academy, you know, could, could be that. Um, yeah, no, we have definitely have a lot of folks, uh, who have come through it and then, and then launched and frankly quit their jobs, <laughs> you know, after, after launching and, and working on their product for six months or a year. Um, the early one was, was Ruben Gomez, uh, with bid sketch. And he was kind of the, the first, the Cinderella story when he and I, um, I was mentoring him early on and he joined the Academy and then, you know, poof, came out and did bid sketch. And then, uh, there's a couple dozen others. Um, funny, I can't remember the, I mean, so there's like app design vault, uh, which is themes and skins for, for iOS apps. Um, there's, uh, Oh yeah, I'm. I should know a bunch of these. I if I went to the website, I was on there earlier, and there's yeah. a bunch of cool logos. You can yeah, I see yes. all of them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Don Donor Elf and <laughs> uh, and BV Commerce. Yes, and Light Point Security. They're all there. So I can rattle them off, but you you can go check them out. What about um? What's been a painful moment in in business for you? Um, I think it. You know, it's funny. It comes back to, well, frankly, there was. Uh, there was a guy who basically was, in retrospect, was kind of a, a troll, and he came on my blog and posted rude stuff, and I was kind of like, all right, you know, this is this is my house, and it's kind of like coming into someone's house and, you know, breaking their furniture or something. I don't know. It just it seemed really odd, so I, I deleted his comments, and frankly, he went ballistic after that, and he started emailing me and um, calling me all types of crazy stuff because he was like, you're censoring he was saying I was censoring criticism of my work, but it was, this is very odd, like not, uh, it was just an odd, odd, a lot of odd things to say. And then he started doing it publicly. And I remember I had this kind of fear that like, Oh no, he's saying this stuff publicly. And my wife, who's a psychologist, she said, what, what are you afraid of? You know what? He's saying this stuff. So who cares? And I said, well, what if someone believes him? And she said, well, is it true? And I said, well, of course not. And she said, well, there you go. You know, like you've, you've invested in enough people and you've given enough away that if, if someone came up, you know, she gave me an example, you know, you follow um, whoever, Heaton Shaw, Jason Cohen, Patrick McKenzie. If someone came out and you saw a Hacker News post of someone talking about them, what would you think? And I think, oh, I think that guy's crazy or that guy's an idiot or whatever. And she said, yeah, people are going to think the same thing about that. And so she was the one that basically talked me down because it stressed me out big time and it took me I was kind of derailed for on and off for a couple of weeks about that one and it was you know it comes back to the judgment and the, and the being ashamed you know of, of someone saying bad about you and thinking well is that true is that is it really true what he's saying about me and it's like you can't you can't let people have that kind of power over you you yeah. know it is hard though I mean you could get a hundred yep. glowing emails and it's that one that you're gonna like latch on to that's exactly right yeah yeah so in in you know going into what best piece of advice would you have for or do you have for a business owner or someone running sites or trying to get into you know doing this yeah the advice that i'm giving now is learn to fail well but failure is absolutely a learned skill and that you can get better at it over time so how do we do that because it's well, like you know no one likes to fail <laughs> i don't think i you know yeah. So how do you do it? So the the more you fail, the better you get at it. And I think there's two things there's two things that I've learned to take away from failures. The first thing is to not fear it as much. And the second thing is to learn from the failures individually. To actually, no matter how painful they are or embarrassing, that you actually do a post mortem, you look at them and say, What did I learn that I will do differently next time? And so the first part of that I said is like you learn not to fear them as much. I think back to, um, I blogged about this and talked about this before, but it's like, 
I think back to my very the very first time I ever posted a comment on a forum in the late 90s and I remember like being terrified and and being hot and the the sweats you know the hair standing up on the back of my neck and just not knowing I was so scared of it and yet I did it and engaged and, and good things come from that and then the very first blog post I ever published same thing happened and then pretty soon you get over that and then the first product launch I ever did the first interview I ever did the first podcast episode I ever recorded the first uh, you know in person talk like you were talking about in Vancouver I was terrified first conference I threw with microconf all of these things I was so terrified going into them but you learn that getting over that fear it it raises your bar of what you're able to do because you you lose the fear of failing because you realize hmm even if I fail at this, what's what's really the worst that's going to come out of it? And you said early on too, like it's tough to put yourself out there. And you had that incident with your with the other staff about the Ink Magazine. What was it like when you put your first blog post out there? And you kind of put yourself out there. Like how'd you get to that point? Oh man, I was. I remember publishing it and then re and then going to it and rereading it over and over and then tweaking the grammar, tweaking the punctuation, tweaking the grammar again and spending hours on this. It's like a three paragraph blog post. It's not even very good, but I just, um, I knew that I had, it's, it, it comes back to that. I knew that I had to do that. I knew that for myself, I had to get over it in order to ultimately be happy that if I wasn't going to be creating things and actually like impacting the world in a larger way than just me and my, you know, me sitting at my house watching reruns of Friends, that I wouldn't be happy. And so that's what convinced me to push past that fear. And what about with MicroConf? Because that's another level. Now it's not just you. You have speakers that you're yeah. trying to live up, attendees. Yeah. How does that? Well, by, so by the time I got to throwing MicroConf, I had gotten over these other you know these other fears and so it it allows you to kind of move move into things that are even scarier and that would have seemed ridiculous uh five years earlier but i have more i just have more confidence that i'm able to execute and i have more confidence that that i will be yeah that i'll be able to do it and so i was very i was quite scared at at the first microconf but you know the adrenaline kicks in and then within the first hour you realize that things are gonna things are gonna go okay, and if they don't, that you'll just you'll pivot. Um, yeah. Were there any of those moments, like, because there's stuff that's out of your control too, like the room's not ready or the venue? Was there stuff that you remember that happened that you're, you know, if you would have thought that ahead of time, it would have freaked you out, but you just you pushed through it and it wasn't that big of a deal as you thought? Yeah, I think the the anticipation for me specifically, and I bet a lot of people out there, the anticipation of of something going wrong is a lot worse than when it actually goes wrong. We had a speaker who had an emergency and literally the night before microconf, he had, he, I think he had like flown to Vegas where microconf was. And then that night he texts us at midnight and he's like, they, their site had an outage, their SAS, funded SAS app and like they got hacked or something. And he basically jumped on a flight and headed out. So we lose a speaker the night before. Right. And I'm talking to, you know, my, my co-host of the conference, Mike Tabor, and we're just like, what do we do? What do we do? And you know what? We, we filled in a gap. We moved Mike in that slot. And so that bought us another 24 hours because then we had a second day gap. And then we, we did some other things that actually turned out to be way better than, than having another speaker. You know, we did some teardowns and some interactive stuff that became a piece that now fits into the conference every year that we're making more room for. So once it hit, the adrenaline goes and we just like, we need to make a decision, go. But if I had thought about that in advance, I'd right. have been, it could keep you from doing something, you know? Yeah, it would keep you up at night. Yep. <laughs> but that's yep. a good one, yeah. So what about um, a piece of advice you got from a mentor that's been valuable? Yeah, I, I had a mentor. Um, his name was Gene Revisa, and he ran that construction firm I talked about earlier uh, that my dad worked for for many years and, and I worked for for a few years. And he used to say, no matter what business you're in, you're in the people business, so you need to invest in people that basically no business can run without people and not even employees but you know you always have customers or partners or you just need support you need colleagues um and that's the thing i've realized is i thought when i was doing flogs and feed shot and dotnet invoice that i could do all of this myself I, I had it in my head that somehow i could i could do it without needing other people and i think it goes back to not wanting to share with other people because i was um you know em embarrassed at what they would say or something like that and 
the more, once I started to share on my blog uh, and started to engage other people about this and then kind of giving back and, and mentoring people and, and teaching and stuff, that's when that stuff starts coming back to you. And I have never made faster strides in my business and my professional life than since the days that I started sharing. Like that's what has accelerated me into being able to put on a conference. You know, if I hadn't in gotten other people uh, engaged in what I was doing as well as, as um, just kind of making, making friends and bringing other people along on the journey, you know, and trying to help them as well. Like that's, it's amazing the people that come out of the woodwork offering to help you once you've helped a lot of people over a few years. I'm even seeing that now with my, the new app that I'm, I'm launching. Um, and people are literally emailing me, people that I don't know are, are offering to be, to test it or to, or to refer other people or, you know, it's people who have listened to my podcast or, you know, somehow been, been influenced by me, but, um, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's striking. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things internally, it's, it's hard to do sometimes, like put yourself out there. Do you remember like, cause someone may be thinking like, yeah, that sounds good. And they're, they're intending to do it. What's something that maybe you put out there that you were almost afterwards, you were scared or embarrassed that it actually, you know, was fine or you got a good feedback. Um, well, gosh, launching the Academy, the Micropreneur Academy, I was very scared. And the reason was I was just really anxious about it. A number of reasons. Number one, no one was charging for anything in the startup space. Like no one was teaching that well. But as a result, there were just these random blog posts everywhere. And so I was, uh, as far as I know, kind of the first person to do that. And so I was concerned I was going to get criticized for that. And I was, but it became that, you know, my anticipation of it was way worse than the actual criticism mm -hmm. that came through it, as which is as usual how it goes. Um, I was also concerned that, you know, people would get in there and say, oh, this is a bunch of crap. You know, this isn't actually helpful. You don't know what you're doing. I mean, all these things. And that never happened. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was successful from you know from day one and but that fear actually made it really motivated me to do you know my best work on it make it the best possible yeah so how do you decide what to charge uh at that time how my pricing yeah picked because if, no if no one is charging <laughs> what, what do you yeah how do you decide? I know i know and that was the hard part is that it was you know it was a i I made it a membership website, so it's a monthly fee, right. and it's 50, it's fifty bucks a month. Um, and I knew that twenty five was too low, and a hundred, I wanted to get a hundred, but I thought it was probably too much. And so I started at fifty, and I later tested prices up around eighty and around a hundred, and they just the churn rate was too high. Hmm. So I okay. kind of picked picked it and pick out of thin air and test. And another note, Rob. So I mean, we get a lot of advice we should follow. What about a not so good piece of advice that you found to be untrue? Yeah, I, you know, Cause a lot think, of people offer advice, you know? Yeah, that's right. I think that, so there are two things actually. Um, one is a lot of people offered me advice like you're wasting your time. Don't do this. Why are you working nights and weekends? We're going to happy hour you know, to go hang out with people and, and this is never going to amount to anything. And there's, there's no one specific time I can think of people doing that, but it's, there's, there's this, this vibe that you get from people when you talk about doing something creative like this, that's scary and that scares other people. And they almost want to naysay it. Now, luckily that's not, no one in my family did that. I know a lot of folks who, who get pushed back from either their spouse or their parents. Mm -hmm. That's a really hard way to do it, right? Yeah. Is, is the advice is not do this when you really want to. The other thing that I, I realize is people give you advice with so much certainty. They use words like should, must, never, always. Anytime someone has that much certainty and uses those words, it's a big red flag for me. And so if they say you must always launch a venture backed startup, you must never launch a this and that, this, I instantly think, huh, really? Never. I should never do that. Like there has to be a case where I should do that. And I'm not just trying to pick apart words, but mm -hmm. too much certainty should be a red flag for you, period. Right. And then, and that's the tough part. Like if naysayers that are friends, but what if it's a close family and what if like, is yeah. there someone maybe you respect who, you know, you, they give you advice that you don't agree with. Did that ever happen? It, it did. Um, you know, and maybe honest, thinking, maybe maybe you second guess yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think early on, um, 
I, I had, uh, there was a mentor at my, that first company, the construction firm. And when I told him I was going to go out and do like a small bit, you know, start my own thing, because I was kind of slated to be, I was in management and I was slated to be, you know, to rise the ranks and run this big, this big firm, or at least be somewhere in the ranks of it. And it was all set up and it was all um, running, you know, it was a big company. And so when I said I wanted to go do my own thing, he basically said, you don't realize how much work it is and you don't realize how easy it is to fail. And I would encourage you not, not to go do this, but instead to take the reins of this thing. Um, that was a really tough decision because he was definitely a personal friend as well as a mentor. Um, and he's looking out for you. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And he wasn't, he had my best interest in mind. You know, I really believe that. Um, but I don't think he could quite understand that that wasn't the place for me. And in mm-hmm. retrospect, it was absolutely the right decision, not just because what I've done has been successful, but because that just construction and, and that whole world was, it was a, and big companies for me, it's, it would have been the wrong decision. Right, you're happier what you're doing yep. now, no matter absolutely. what. Yep. So I have one last question for you, Rob, but before I ask it, I'm uh, really interested in the answer to it. Um, but tell us a little bit more about your business, what you're working on now that's, that's exciting to you. Sure. So, you know, as you said in the intro, I, I do a lot of different things, to, including uh, conferences and, and software products and mm-hmm. such. Um, the the one thing that I'm really stoked about right now and I'm focusing a ton of, of energy on is, is a, a software product. Called, it's a web app called Drip. And it's basically, it's an email marketing application that we're trying to make it the easiest way to get uh, like an email mini course online, an email sequence. Um, so right now it takes, you know, several hours to do that. And, and we want to we, I think we've achieved it, getting it down to several minutes instead. Mm. Um, and so we looking to, you know, we have 20 people using it right now and we're looking to launch in, in August and I'm super excited about it. So give me an example, like what, what is it used for? Like what would be like a case example? Yeah. Yeah. So it's ideal. Um, you know, the, the two markets or the two groups of people who are using it right now are either uh, software companies and, and, and SaaS apps or bloggers. And it could be used in a lot of other, uh, you know, applications, but those are the the people who are using it now. And basically, it adds a little um, pop-up widget to your website. So it's not uh, uh, like a uh, welcome gate or anything like that, but it, it sits in the lower right, kind of like a little chat thing. And, you know, it'll pop up and say, hey, would you like to receive a free email mini course on long tail SEO, as mm-hmm. an example, or on how to take better photos, you know, how to be a better photographer or whatever and you give your email and then it sends you a, a sequence of emails over the next five to seven days and that's that's really it um it really it gets people engaged because you're educating them you're starting to build a relationship and so for these software companies and SaaS apps a few of which i own myself and we're using it on it's it's dramatically you know gives you a, a double digit bump in conversions basically because you're retaining so many more people that would have otherwise hit your site and just left they're now you know, 10% of your people, 5% of your people are, are giving you an email address and you're able to re-engage with them later. And then for the bloggers, it's just about, uh, you know, for bloggers, the, the size of their list is such a big deal. And so this widget, you instantly add it to every, you can instantly add it to every page on your website, poof, with one click, instead of having to go through and embed, you know, like a MailChimp widget or an AWP Right, widget. right. So that's, that's cool. The, yeah. I like that. What about, what else? You have, um, you have so much going on. My, well, micro, so MicroConf Europe yeah. is uh, coming up. First first time we're doing it in Europe. We've done it in Vegas for the past three years. And uh, we're doing it in Prague in October. And um, wow. really excited about that. Yeah, we have a, a friend, a colleague on the ground who's handling all the logistics for us. And so it's been a much better experience putting it together. But it's for bootstrapped software startups and uh, single founders. So what made so, you decide to do it in Europe? You feel like it's getting too easy in Vegas? What, yeah, do you want yeah. more of a challenge? <laughs> no, it's because we, we have a lot of demand for the conference and we aren't able to fill that because we don't want to grow the conference to be 500 people. Um, and we, you know, we want to let in about 100 and right around 150 is where we cap it, 150, 160. If you go to 500, it becomes not intimate. And yet we have this waiting list of 60 to, to 80 people every time that we right. never get to. So it's like, well, there's this more demand. How can we how can we help those people as well you know is really what it is so the it seems like the logical way is to geographically do it and uh i think that's it's been successful so far um we just sold we're almost sold out we put tickets on on the market last week so so how do you as an entrepreneur hold yourself back from making it bigger i mean that's like 
yeah, you I see know. there's like all this demand and then you want to yeah. keep it intimate, but there's all this demand. How do you stay disciplined to do that? Um, it's hard, but we, the, it's good that Mike and I co-host the conference because we keep each other accountable to that. And anytime one of us says, well, should we grow it to two, maybe right. we can do 200. We can just have a breakout guy. session. It's more intimate. Yep. Like, yep. I, I'm really dedicated. We've been to, we go to conferences that are 225 people and it just feels different. And I really, really want to keep it small. So yeah. it's, it's just been, microconf has been a unique experience, I think for the attendees, Definitely for me. Yeah, I'm building the conference I want to attend every year. Right. And the conference I want to attend has 150 people in it. Yeah. I guess it goes with your book, right? Start small, stay small. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, anything else to mention? Or where can people reach out to you and find yeah, you? Yeah, sure. They can um, reach out to me, uh, softwarebyrob.com. Mm -hmm. that, that's my blog. And startupsfortherestofus.com is, is my podcast. And those are the places I hang out most frequently. Okay. So I have one last question for you, Rob, and I appreciate your time thus far. Um, so when I look at you, I would never expect um, necessarily, you know, no judgment, good or bad, that you'd have a tattoo. Okay. I have two, actually. So, I, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Well, so the first one is here, and um, it says create on my wrist. And I got this one when I realized that that that's who I had to be. Like I, I kind of had this self-realizing moment when I was 31 or something that if I'm, whenever I'm not creating things that I'm in control of, whether it's writing a book or writing, a, creating a podcast or uh, the Micropreneur Academy or building software, all of that is creating for me. Um, when I'm not doing that, I shrivel up and I become a mean person. You know, I just become... Um, I don't know if I ever see you being a mean unfulfilled. Person. Yeah, I'm not yeah, mean. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm more like grouchy and like I I become disenfranchised. I become mad about work. I become I start hating what I'm doing. It's really interesting that that it goes for a month about a month or two into it. I just can't do it. And so that's why I realized that because I was kind of a job hopper, you know, for a few years, as you can imagine. And I was oh, people would say, "Oh, you shouldn't do that." Da, 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 da. And you know, I've realized that's okay. Like this, I I need to create. You know, and so that was that. And the other one actually is, uh, you probably can't read it, but it says, never apologize for your art. And it's in my, my own handwriting. And that comes back to my art happens to be, maybe it isn't painting. Maybe my art is building businesses and, yeah. and doing other things. And so I stopped apologizing for that a while ago. Just, just a few years ago, I realized that it's okay that that's what I do. Like, what were you apologizing for before? Um, well, thinking that, you know, I was a musician at one point. And so I still sometimes hang out with musicians and they're still fighting the good fight and trying to be professional musicians. Some of them mm -hmm. are. And so I would be like, oh, yeah, Rob sold out and now he's a business guy. See, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know what? That, you're right. But like, I, I can't, I'm not going to apologize for, for what I'm doing now because I really, really enjoy it. And I do still play guitar and I do still write songs. Um, I just, it's not my, my focus. Yeah. Rob, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I got a lot of valuable information. I'm sure everyone else did too. So always a pleasure. It is indeed. Thank you so much for having Thanks. me on.